So last time we talked about embeddings and word representations generally. Today we're going to focus a little bit more on a specific example of embeddings, word to vec Most people treat word to vec as a black box, and that's fine. word to vec is very useful on its own, and you don't necessarily need to understand how it works to be able to use it. It's very useful as a feature representation. But today we'll talk a little bit about word to vec so that you can understand its intuitions and you can understand why it might screw up in specific cases. And we'll also talk about the relationship between word to vec and other forms of distributional semantics and how to represent words in a continuous space. So when most people talk about word to vec, they're specifically talking about an implementation of word to vec that you can find on GitHub. And so this is a very popular piece of code. It's very fast, it's very well written, and it's very useful. If they're not talking about this piece of code, then they're talking about embeddings that have been induced using this piece of code on various data sets. And so the way that this works is you take a large collection of text, you then feed it into the algorithm, and then you get these vectors out. And the output is a matrix that has rows for every word in your vocabulary and columns for all of the dimensions that you want to learn. And typically, the number of dimensions is between 50 and say a thousand, but typically in the range of 200 to 300. And the nice thing about the vectors that you get out of this is you get similarities between uh, relevant things. So if you look at the nearest neighbors of dog, once you get this matrix out, you will see things like cat and dogs and ducks and so on. And if you look at uh, even proper names like Teva, you get other pharmaceutical related terms related to that. So it's not just capturing common sense knowledge, it's also capturing world knowledge. And from these representations, you can do a lot of neat things. So for example, you can compute similarity between terms. You can take two vectors and see what their dot product is. And so uh, you can look at the cosine similarity in the general case, but typically people talk about dot products because they assume that all of the vectors have been normalized so that their length is one. And so as a result, you typically want to normalize the vectors when you load them in if they're not already normalized. So let's say that you want to find the most similar words to the vector for dog. If you want to do that, an efficient way to do that is to apply the matrix of your embeddings to the vector dog. And so then you will get a one by V matrix of similarities. And then you take whatever words have the highest scores. Computers can do these matrix multiplications very efficiently. So this is a lot better than say searching using nearest neighbor search or something like this. You want to compute those similarities explicitly and then find the things with the highest values. And again, this is taking advantage of the optimizations that people have done over decades for linear algebra operations. So here is some uh, Python code to do just that, taking advantage of the NumPy library to do these computations very quickly. So you want to get the dog vector out, you compute the dot product uh, with the entire matrix uh, with this dog vector, and then you get the uh, indices of the words uh, that have the highest similarity, and then you can get whatever those words are. The identities of those words. So this gives you a very fast computation of the most similar words. Let's say that you have a document and you want to compute similarities between words. So in that case, you can take all the individual words, compute the dot products, and then you can sum those similarities together. That's actually uh, perfectly reasonable, but turns out to be wasteful. And you can first sum the words together and then compute the matrix product directly and then look at those similarities. When we talk about word to vec, we're often talking about a family of different implementations. There are different ways to do the training, there are different ways to represent the context, and I'm going to focus on the uh, negative sampling approach with skip grams. So the same intuitions will apply to other methods, but to be precise we'll focus on, on this combination of implementation. So the way that word to vec works is that it will learn two matrices. 
Each of these matrices are V by D. It has a row for every word and a column for each of the dimensions that you're going to learn. And there are separate matrices for both words and contexts. And there's no specific relationship given a row for a specific word tying these two things together between the word matrix and the context matrix. And they will kind of have some correspondence just because of the inherent properties of the data, but that's all that's going on. And so you initialize these matrices randomly and then you want to update them. And you update them by looking at data. So the way that this works is you have an example and you focus on an individual word. In this case, let's say that we're focusing on the word heifer. And the context has some number of words. In this case, let's say that we're going to look at six context words. And what we want to do is we want to make it so that the vectors that correspond to each of the context words, when you take the dot product of that word with the focus word, you're going to have a high value once you pass that dot product through some nonlinearity, let's say a logistic function. So you want those scores to be high. But at the same time, you want other scores to be low. And this is where the concept of negative sampling comes in. We want to find other words that are not heifer. And so let's choose a random word from the vocabulary, say comet, and we want the dot product between that word's representation and the context words in the same context to be low. Let's think about, <clears throat> okay, one last time. Let's think about this like logistic regression. You have examples that are positive examples. You want the probability to be high for that. And you have examples that are negative examples. And you want the probability of that to be low. So this looks a lot like logistic regression, where your example looks something like this, and your feature vectors look like your context words. Or you can obviously flip it around and think about it that way as well, if that makes more sense to you. So if you do this again and again and again, you go through all of your examples, you select a bunch of negative contexts for each of those examples. If you do this again and again and again, you'll end up with representations of words such that the dot product for good word context combinations is high and for bad ones it's low. And at the end of the day you throw away the context vectors and you just use the W matrix to represent your words going forward and you use that in your downstream application. But let's say that we didn't throw that away. What does the product of your word matrix and the transpose of your context matrix look like. In this case, you'll end up with a V by V matrix because uh, words is V by D, context transpose is D by V, so the outer dimensions are V by V. And so then you get a matrix where each row corresponds to a word, each column corresponds to a context or a word, and each cell gives you an association between those two things. So does this look familiar somehow? Is there another way that we could have derived these two skinny matrices? And if you remember linear algebra, this may look a little bit like a singular value decomposition, where we're using these two low rank representations, words and context, to approximate this very big a co-occurrence probability matrix. And if you wanted to, you could use this SVD to represent words in continuous space, and people have done that uh, for decades. And word to vec isn't really doing anything that's all that different. And there's a nice paper from Levy and Goldberg that actually go through why these things can be thought of as equivalent, so long as you do a, a couple of tricks that we'll talk a little bit more about in a second. So given all this, why are we doing this word defect stuff if SVD can be just as good? The thing is that word defect is super fast and it can scale to much larger data sets. You can also use multiple threads to take advantage of computers with many different processors uh, to get results 
fast and on very large data sets. And because SVD is a very expensive computation, it hasn't been applicable to very large data sets in the past. And one of the reasons that word to vec has been so successful is that it can run on very large data sets, even though theoretically it's not all that different from an SVD representation of the words. Next, we'll talk about what it means to have good representation and the details of how you represent context to get good representations of words.